In 2012, 16-year-old Alex Skeel started dating Jordan Worth, outwardly a bright, bubbly 16-year-old who had aspirations of being a teacher. However, this relationship would almost cost Alex his life. Jordan Worth is a very dangerous young woman who subjected Alex to a campaign of abuse of almost five years. She controlled every aspect of his life, banned him from seeing his friends and talking to his family, took control of his money and forced him to quit his job and instead go to classes with her at university even though he wasn't studying there. Between 2016 and 2017, the abuse escalated significantly. Jordan burnt, starved and stabbed Alex with him being forced to bind his wounds with cling film and football socks. Her abuse turned a happy teenager into a shell of a man. It was only with the help of a persistent police officer and Alex's own bravery that the abuse came to an end in June 2017 and he was able to get proper medical treatment with doctors saying that he was 10 days away from death. When confronted with her behaviour, Jordan showed no remorse for her actions and was completely disconnected from reality. Here was her talking about attacking Alex with a knife. Tell me about the knife. Oh, it was a big one, um, one from the kitchen. Yeah, I think it was a bread knife, I'm not actually sure. So how, how far do you think the knife went in, Jordan? I don't think it went that far, but it did do a lot of blood. Jordan Worth was the first woman in the UK to be convicted of coercive and controlling behaviour in a relationship but the lenient sense she got, her remorselessness, and the horror that she put Alex through is truly sickening. Welcome to Evil Among Us. I need to start by saying something, which I did on a previous occasion. This is an important video raising awareness about male victims of domestic abuse. I'm passionate about giving people like this a voice. To be abused by someone who claims to love you is the ultimate betrayal. However, people still say things like, why didn't they just leave? Domestic abusers are often relentless, master manipulators, and frequently dangerous. Sometimes leaving costs people their lives. I'm concerned that as I'm talking about a male, people might make comments about him not being a real man or something. Honestly, that's part of the problem. Men who are victims of this type of abuse rarely report it because they're worried about being judged. Alex Skeel, the victim in this case has had the courage to tell his story and should be commended and not condemned. And like any survivor of domestic abuse, male or female, they should have our support and respect. So if you're thinking of posting something that in any way blames the victims of domestic abuse or disrespects them, then just don't. I don't think that's too much to ask. So Alexander Skeel was born on the 17th of August 1995 in Luton in the county of Bedfordshire in the UK. He didn't have the easiest start in life. One of twins, he and his brother Luke were born prematurely and weighed just two pounds when they entered the world. They spent weeks in intensive care and underwent multiple operations. The boys thankfully pulled through, much to the relief of their parents. The twins had been, throughout their lives, especially close to their mother, Geraldine. The family lived in the village of Stuartby, south of the town of Bedford. Alex was a happy and caring child. He was also football mad and had aspirations about becoming a professional footballer. He was interested in girls but had never dated before and this all changed in 2012 when he met 16 year old Jordan Worth at Bedford College. I usually use the last name of the perpetrators in my videos but it flows better if I use the first name in this case so that's what I'm going to do. Very little has been publicly reported about Jordan Worth's background. She was born in April 1995, but the details of her parents, or whether she had any siblings, haven't been published. It's reported that she grew up in the small village of Ridgemont in Bedfordshire, and came from, quote, a loving and supportive family. However, as I'll go into later, I find this almost impossible to believe, considering the things she did. Jordan was a high achiever in school, and was a trained gymnast, she was also an animal lover and volunteered to help abandoned animals and was even involved in charity work to raise money for children in Africa. She had aspirations about becoming a teacher and so, outwardly, everything seemed to suggest that Jordan Worth was a caring and kind young lady who appeared to want to spend the rest of her life caring for others. 
nothing could be further from the truth. This is the impression she gave to both Alex and his friends when they met. She was attentive, warm, and hung on Alex's every word, and the pair began dating. They looked like any other teenage couple, but Jordan was hiding who she really was. An insecure, mentally unstable abuser, with a pathological need to control her partners, and she had no hesitation using manipulation, threats, and eventually serious violence to get what she wanted, and she began to display this behaviour soon after the pair got together. Jordan's control of Alex started subtly, with her commenting that she didn't like the clothes or shoes that he wore, or how he styled his hair. Alex was eager to impress Jordan, so he went along with what she said. These comments clearly don't always mean a partner is abusive. They could potentially come from a place of caring, with someone telling their partner how they could dress in order to boost how they feel about themselves. However, this was not the case with Jordan. She was getting Alex used to following her instructions and chipping away his perception of himself. Quickly, Jordan's behaviour became more bizarre and concerning. In April 2013, Jordan turned 18 and, as a treat, Alex and his parents treated her to an overnight trip to London where they had tickets to see The Lion King. However, all of a sudden, Jordan disappeared. Alex and his parents were frantically searching for her, calling her on her mobile phone, but she wouldn't answer. After an hour, they found Jordan sat in the lobby of the hotel they were staying at, laughing her head off. Alex and his family found her behaviour very odd. It was only years later that he realised what she was doing. Jordan was emotionally manipulating him, getting Alex to worry about her, trying to force a deeper bond between them, but also instilling in him the fear that she could potentially just disappear. It's far easier to control someone if they're constantly on the back foot, if you make them unsure of what's going on, if they don't know whether they're coming or going. Jordan quickly began showing irrational jealousy, with her appearing to have an issue with Alex speaking to or even being anywhere near other girls. This led to her ruining his 18th birthday party in August 2013. At the party, there were a hundred guests and everyone was having a good time when all of a sudden, Jordan began literally screaming in the face of a 15 year old family friend, accusing her of trying to take Alex away from her. Her behaviour was so loud and unexpected that the party came to a halt and everyone just stared at what was going on. It was at this point that Alex's friends took him to one side and said there was something seriously wrong. People shouldn't act that way, and they told him that he should end the relationship now. However, Alex had fallen in love with Jordan. She was his first relationship. He, like a lot of people, made excuses for her behaviour, but also, as he'd never had a girlfriend before, he didn't realise that this was not how people should act. However, this was just the beginning. Jordan would repeatedly accuse Alex of cheating on her, without any evidence, and, despite him trying to reassure her, she would repeat these accusations again, and again, and again. She convinced herself that Alex was texting other girls, and on one occasion, snatched his phone, took out the SIM card and snapped it in half. This was enough for Alex, and he broke up with Jordan at the end of August 2013. But, two days later, there was a knock on Alex's door. Jordan was there, and she dropped a bombshell. She said she was pregnant. Showing that Alex's mother Geraldine had sized up what sort of a person Jordan was, she demanded that she took a pregnancy test in the house and show her the results. This confirmed that Jordan was indeed pregnant. Geraldine and Alex were concerned to say the least. Alex had tried to break away from Jordan and now she was telling him that she was carrying his child. Total respect to Alex, he stepped up and told Jordan that although they couldn't be together, he would support her and raise their child. However, Jordan then disappeared despite trying to contact her, Alex didn't hear from her or see her during the entire pregnancy. He was not at the birth of their first child, a boy called TJ, in May 2014, and only found out about this when Jordan sent him a message saying they had a son. It was not until August 2014, when TJ was three months old, that Jordan contacted Geraldine and asked if she wanted to meet her grandson. Despite her misgivings about Jordan, Geraldine of course said yes and, when she met TJ, she instantly fell in love. This was the first time that Geraldine had seen Jordan in a year, and she was fooled into thinking that she changed. Jordan said that motherhood had changed her, and her only focus now was on raising their son. Alex was wary, and so the first time he met TJ was without Jordan being present. 
Alex asked his grandfather, who he was especially close to, to also be there for support and to meet his great grandson. Alex too instantly fell in love. From that point on, Jordan would bring TJ around like clockwork every weekend to see his dad and the two soon became inseparable. Breaking here, it's important to point out that domestic abusers will often progress relationships quickly and suggest taking huge steps soon after they've begun. This can include moving in together, but this can go as far as suggesting getting married or having children. In some cases that I'm aware of, there have been men who have pierced holes in condoms with the deliberate intention of getting their partners pregnant. The reason for this is to form a bond with their partner and put them in a position where they would struggle to completely break away. Unfortunately, domestic abusers will often use whatever they can to victimise their partner. If they're married, they'll sometimes refuse to grant a divorce. In the case of children, due to their self-centeredness and utter selfishness, they will use them as pawns to hurt their former partner, demanding contact even if they've been completely absent during the children's lives. They may also turn the children against their mother or use them to get information. Honestly, the way children are used in domestic abuse cases is truly disgusting. In this respect, I think it's likely that Jordan Worth deliberately became pregnant as she felt this would form a link with Alex and that even if he wanted to escape, it would be far more difficult. He could leave her, but would he really leave his child? Her disappearance during the entire pregnancy is another example of her emotional manipulation and I've no doubt this was deliberate, with her showing Alex who was in charge. So, you want to break up with me? Fine, but you don't get to be at the birth of your son. When he was born, she could then wave TJ in front of Alex and use him as a way to worm her way back into his life. And this is exactly what happened. Jordan also convinced Alex that motherhood had changed her and over the next few months, the pair became closer and closer and spent more time together until eventually, in January 2015, they rekindled their relationship. For a few short months, everything was fine. However, Jordan soon began showing her true colours. Her accusations of cheating started all over again, and there was one instance in May 2015 which showed how unstable she really was. Specifically, whilst Jordan, Alex and TJ were driving in the local area one day, they came across the same family friend that Jordan had screamed at at Alex's 18th birthday party in 2013. Despite the fact that almost two years had passed, Jordan began screaming abuse at this girl in the street. Word quickly got back to Geraldine, who confronted Jordan and said that this behaviour would not be tolerated again. In response, Jordan packed up TJ and Alex's belongings and gave him a choice, his family or her. If he chose his family, she would go, take their son with her and never come back. Alex was put in an impossible situation, but he wanted to be in his son's life and so the pair moved in with Jordan's family and then into a property together. Away from his family home, and especially when they moved into their own flat, Alex's skill was trapped and Jordan Worth quickly sought to utterly control him, including isolating him from his friends and family who didn't see or hear from him for the next two years before eventually starving him and subjecting him to horrific violence which almost cost him his life. With TJ and Alex living at the family home, Jordan ramped up the level of control. She destroyed Alex's mobile phone and bought him another one with a new number, but he was forbidden from sharing this with his friends and family. She also deleted his Facebook account and set up a joint one which only she had access to. As I said earlier, Alex didn't have contact with or see his friends and family for two years and a legitimate question is why they didn't call the police if they didn't have contact with him for this long. The problem is they thought they were in contact with him. Jordan set up fake Facebook profiles and would send messages to his friends and family, apparently from Alex, mocking them and telling them to leave him alone. Geraldine tried to contact her son and, on one occasion, sent him £1 via internet banking with quote, I love you, written as the reference. In response, she received a message back saying, quote, leave me alone. In addition, Jordan had retained Alex's old SIM card, so would respond to messages sent to him, again telling people not to contact him anymore. So of course his friends and family were concerned, but to them, Alex had apparently chosen Jordan and didn't want anything to do with them anymore. 
Jordan Worth's emotional manipulation of Alex was nothing short of sickening. One day, she came home and told Alex that she'd received a message from his mother Geraldine telling her that his grandfather, who, as I said earlier, was someone he was very close to, had died. Alex was devastated and hysterical. He spent the next few hours crying, curled up on his bed, trying to come to terms with this horrific news. Jordan simply stood and watched. Eventually, she told him the truth. She was lying. His grandfather was fine, and she began laughing and mocking him for how much he loved his family. Jordan's jealousy bordered on the pathological. She would accuse Alex of cheating morning, noon and night. She eventually took away his PlayStation so that he could not communicate with his friends, but especially other girls via game chat. However, despite taking away every single means of him communicating with the outside world, the accusations continued. This included her accusing him of cheating on her during the year that she disappeared whilst pregnant with TJ, despite them not being together and this clearly being none of her business. It got to the point where Jordan forced Alex to quit his job and accompany her everywhere she went and this included him attending classes with her at the University of Hertfordshire where she was studying for a degree in teaching. So he would be forced to sit in lectures for a subject he had no interest in just so Jordan could keep an eye on him and make sure he wasn't cheating on her. So why did Alex stay? Two primary reasons. Firstly, like most domestic abusers, this was not how Jordan acted all the time. There would be periods, even though they became shorter and shorter, where she would be the Jordan he originally met, loving, attentive and caring. The switch in her behaviour, which was entirely deliberate, messed with Alex's head. He didn't know whether he was coming or going. As time progressed, he started questioning his own reality and began to link him doing what Jordan told him to do with keeping the loving partner he used to know and wanted around and keeping the monster at bay. Secondly, Alex stayed for his son. He was terrified that if he left Jordan, she would take TJ and disappear. I think he was unfortunately right. TJ was a tool to manipulate Alex, and I would question, as I'll come back to later, how much she actually cared about this child outside of what he gave her. The pair moved into their own flat in July 2016. This was only a short distance away from Alex's parents' house, but they had no idea that he was literally a stone's throw away as their son had been completely cut out of their lives. There was a period of calm when they first moved in, and Jordan said she wanted to try for another baby, and, almost instantly, she fell pregnant again. However, as soon as she was pregnant, Jordan the abuser returned. No doubt she felt emboldened with the fact that they were now in a flat together. There were no witnesses. She could do whatever she wanted, and she did just that, and the abuse ramped up to a sickening new level, including physical violence. I quote Alex's own words extensively to explain what happened next. He stated, quote, It began when she started sleeping with a glass bottle next to her. She was accusing me of doing things with other girls, talking to them or messaging, which was completely untrue. She kept saying that she'd had messages from people, but much later, I found out she'd been making it up. Then she'd wait until I'd fall asleep and smack me on the head with the bottle. She'd demand, what are you thinking about? After a while, it got to the point where it didn't hurt anymore. I was so used to the pain, I didn't even feel it. So she'd ramp it up to the next level and find a worse way of hurting me. After the bottle, it was a hammer. After that, it was anything she could find to smack me with. One time, it was a laptop charger. She wrapped the cord around her wrist but with a bit of slack and swung the metal plug end at my head. Blood started gushing out. It was pouring onto the floor. I cried, please will you help me, and watched Jordan as she walked up the stairs laughing. She said, why don't you just go and die? No one cares about you. Eventually, Jordan started with knives. She slashed at me. One time, she just missed a major artery in my wrist. Later in court, the full horror of what Alex was subjected to was laid bare. On one occasion, Jordan lunged at Alex with a knife, aiming for his face, with him having to put his hands up to stop from being stabbed in the eye. Then, the boiling water was introduced. Jordan would boil a kettle of water and pour it all over Alex. One of the most unhinged things she did was to buy a five pound lie detector test from the internet, something that clearly is just a joke item, but to her it was deadly serious. She would force Alex to use this 
and bombard him with questions while standing with a kettle of boiling water. If the test indicated he was lying, she would pour the water over him. Alex's body was covered with third degree burns, but Jordan forbid him from seeking medical attention. Instead, he had to treat his own injuries, wrapping them in cling film and football socks. At one point, Jordan beat Alex with a hairbrush to the point where she broke one of his teeth. Again, he was told he couldn't see a dentist, so he had to pull out this tooth. Jordan wouldn't allow Alex to sleep in the bed with her. Instead, he was confined to sleeping on the floor like an animal. On another occasion, Jordan forced Alex to swallow an entire bottle of sleeping pills. By this point, Jordan was in complete control of Alex's money. He had no access to his account or bank cards. This meant she was also responsible for buying food. When she did, this wouldn't be for Alex. He was starved to the point where, by the time his ordeal came to an end, in June 2017, he'd lost 20 kilos, or around 40 pounds in weight. Much of this abuse occurred whilst Jordan was pregnant, and in May 2017, she gave birth to their second child, a daughter called Iris. However, this didn't deter Jordan. She carried on abusing Alex day in and day out. Again, you may question why he stayed. Alex himself has answered this, stating, quote, We had two kids together. I just kept hoping that something would change. The children were babies, but of course, they must have seen what was happening, and while she didn't hurt them directly, my fear was always that if I left, she'd turn her abuse on them, so I stayed. I've no doubt that Alex was right. Jordan Worth is a woman capable of just about anything, and this would have included harming the children. Alex stayed to stop this from happening. By June 2017, Alex's skill was dying. His burns had become infected and he was malnourished, but there was a deadlier issue which was slowly killing him. Specifically, due to the repeated physical assaults mainly aimed at his head, Alex was suffering from hydrocephalus, a build-up of fluid on the brain, putting pressure on it. This can lead to symptoms such as memory issues, headaches, blurred vision, and difficulty walking, and, if left untreated, it can result in permanent brain damage or even death. Luckily, Alex's life was saved, but this was only because of his own bravery and the persistence of one police officer. Those of you who have watched my channel for a while will know that many of my cases highlight police incompetence, but on this occasion, we have an example of a man who clearly took his job to protect the public seriously. His name is Sergeant Ed Finn. On the 3rd of June 2017, Neighbours called Bedfordshire Police, something they'd done on several other occasions due to hearing Alex being attacked. Each time, police had attended, excuses were made, and then they left. On this occasion, the call was made after neighbours heard a woman screaming and a male voice saying, quote, Get off me. Leave me alone. Stop hurting me. Sergeant Finn and another officer attended, and they found a truly disturbing scene. Alex was sat gaunt and semi-conscious on the stairs, cradling his arm and they found a significant amount of blood in the bathroom along with a serrated knife. Jordan was there, completely unfazed, and she told the police that Alex had hurt himself. Jordan had actually attacked Alex with the knife, cutting his wrists, but she claimed these wounds were self-inflicted and that Alex had a condition where he had bouts of depression where he would harm himself. Sergeant Finn noticed other injuries on Alex and became instantly suspicious. Alex was taken to hospital and it was found that the wounds on his wrist were so serious they required surgery. The nurses and doctors also saw all of his other injuries, including burn marks, old slash wounds and stab wounds, and missing teeth, and they were horrified. Alex was being prepped for surgery, but at that point, Jordan arrived and quickly walked Alex out of the hospital. This was despite the nurses and doctors begging him to stay. Why, you may ask, did Alex not raise the alarm here? He explained later, quote, I was scared of Jordan and what she would do. I felt that if I said anything, she could have killed me. Sergeant Finn found out about this and was concerned. He knew he had to do something. An opportunity presented itself on the 10th of June 2017 when another call was made by concerned neighbours. Sergeant Finn asked for the job to be assigned to him and he went to the property. I'll let Sergeant Finn and Alex explain what happened next. Upstairs, you're 
assault you or anything like that today? No, no assault, nothing. It's just arguing. We're just so stressed out. Mm. Are you 100% sure, Alex? Yes, I'm 100% sure. I know, you, I know you've said this to me the other night and you're obviously saying it to me now, but are you 100% sure? Because you're not, you're not looking me in the eye, you're looking at the floor. So those injuries, you're saying you've done them to yourself. They could easily, because of where they are, they could easily not have been done to yourself, right? And just hear me out. Even in the house, he was not budging on his story at all. He was absolutely adamant, no, I do this to myself, I do it to myself. I didn't really want any commotion. I know if the police get involved, it would possibly be really difficult. I was always thinking, how would she react if I did anything wrong or not what she wanted? She would go off her head. That was what was running through my head the whole time. I just wanted to try and be as much on his level as I could. Um, you know, he's he's a few years younger than me, but you're not not a dissimilar age. You know, we're both blokes, and I thought I need to get him out of this environment. Let me go down there, mate, and get him redressed. Grab a jacket and some shoes, mate. Whatever you got, wallet, whatever. So, mate, are you coming back here tonight, mate? He sat me in the police car and he said, right, we're not leaving it until you tell me the truth. You need help, she needs help, your children need help, you all need help. And I still said, no, I, I'm doing this all to myself. I turned my camera off and I, I said to him, look, my camera's off, it's just you and me in this car. Straight away I just said it. And I said, just please just go on what the neighbours have have said because I don't want to say that it's come from me. He just quite calmly said to me, yes, it was her. I just need to explain to you that at the moment you're under arrest on suspicion of assault occasion and grievous bodily harm. I sat her down in the living room. I didn't really know what to expect in terms of how she was going to react because she's very slight, very well-spoken, um, very polite you know, all intents and purposes, friendly and well-meaning young lady. Obviously, it's, it's serious because you have been arrested, yeah? But we'll go down and we'll have a chat at the police station and we'll get everything in black and white properly and give your side of the story on saying about what happened. Yeah? yeah? So what we'll do is we'll leave Iris with your parents. Yeah? yeah. Um, are you happy with that? That's fine, yeah. yeah. Okay. And on the drive back, she was saying to me, oh, so, you know, how long do you think I'm going to be in? Do you think it'll be maybe an hour? I said, oh, it might be a bit longer than that. Sergeant Finn's intervention saved Alex's life and meant that he could get the medical treatment he needed. His extensive burns, which were infected, were dressed and he had to have operations to close the wounds on his wrists and to relieve the pressure from fluid on his brain. Doctors said that Alex was 10 days away from death when he was finally brought to them. Alex could have continued to claim that nothing was wrong and Jordan would have gotten away scot-free, but Alex was brave he told the police everything. At this point, his parents were told the true horror of what had happened to their son. I cannot imagine what they must have felt seeing their boy, who had been reduced to this. Finally, after two years of separation, Alex was reunited with his family, including his beloved grandfather, who Jordan had cruelly told him had died. He was then able to start the long road to recovery, in his own bed, surrounded by people who actually loved him. Jordan Worth was interviewed by the police about the campaign of abuse against Alex, including controlling and coercive behaviour and a catalogue of assaults, including burning him and attacking him with a knife. I want to play excerpts from the interview, which is truly bizarre and unnerving, but when you pick it apart, really gives an insight into the mind of Jordan Worth and highlights just how dangerous she is. Alex seems relieved that he's now going home, back to his family. He mm. feels he's been isolated from. He, never, he always said he just didn't want to see his family. He states that majority of the contact with his family has been stopped because you've stopped him having contact. No, definitely not. Would you say at any point 
you have made it difficult for him to see his friends or family? No, no. He made it very clear he didn't want to see any of his family. He said he hated his family, he didn't want to talk to his family, he wants nothing to do with his family. You're both very young, aren't you? How old are you? 22 and I was 21. Okay. So what you were doing? I was holding a knife. Okay. Just wanted him to come in the house. And tell me about the knife. Oh, it was a big one, um, one from the kitchen. I think it was a bread knife, I'm not actually sure. So mm -hmm. how far do you think the knife went in, Jordan? I don't think it went that far, but it did do a lot of blood. We talked in detail about the incidents that happened on the 3rd of June and 10th of June when the police attended, yeah. okay? And you've accepted that you have thrown water over him yeah. that was boiling, yeah. okay? And you have accepted that you swiped at him with the knife and cut him, yeah. all right? And the other times we just maybe like... But you can't argue about those injuries because they're quite obvious because yeah. the burn marks and the cuts, yeah. okay? Because police attended on both these occasions, all right? I appreciate it. it's stressful, you're both quite young, you've got young children. Yeah. Do you suffer from any mental illness yourself? Mm. Ever suffered from depression? No. Any suffered from any postnatal depression after either pregnancy? No. Alex has said, since mainly that you've been living at this address, yeah. he has almost been attacked or physically put through some sort of um, assault pretty much every day since about September. He states if you missed a night of hitting him, you would then make up for it the next night. Mm. I don't know why he would say that. He says that you go at him about this period of time that you had a break in your relationship, okay? It always goes back to that, yeah. And that you question him mm relentlessly and that you go on about it a lot mm -hmm. and that if he doesn't answer you you then become violent towards him um, subjected him to a lie detector test yeah would you do that regularly no we only did it one I think it was like one day we did it about this hairbrush that you keep in the car well whenever we've had an argument in the car I'll wrapped just my hairbrushes inside and I just sort of hit him either wherever I can. It was a hammer, um, but I never, I never hurt him. I'm not sure if you picked up on the same things that I did. So, Jordan is denying isolating Alex from his family, but then, as if she's talking about going to the shops, admits stabbing him, hitting him with a hammer, and pouring boiling water over him. Oh, so she didn't always stab him. Sometimes it was just tap, tap, tap with the knife. However, when she did stab him, it only went in a little bit. Oh, actually, no, it went in a lot, and there was a loss of blood. But remember, she didn't hurt him. Also, look at her body language and demeanor. I hope you detected the little laugh whilst Jordan was talking at one point. Also, I'm not sure if you picked up on the almost childlike way she's speaking. Yes, she's young, 22 years old, but she talks like a teenager. Behavioural experts who have viewed her police interviews believe this was deliberate, with her presenting herself as meek and mild in order to cast doubt in the police's mind. Surely this small, petite, almost childlike woman would not do these things. Clearly, this is her controlling and manipulative nature coming out, but her tactics are really muddled. She's trying to dupe the police into thinking she is meek and mild, which you would think was part of a strategy to try and wriggle out of this, but then in the same breath, she's saying, oh yeah, I did stab him and poured boiling water on him. To provide a bit of context, if you've had any involvement in police interviews or have seen transcripts of them, you'll know that no comment interviews are very common. The higher the offence seriousness, the more common they are. With domestic abuses, this is especially true. They want to control every situation and when they say no comment, they're essentially saying, go on then, prove it. I would say this accounts for 95% of the interviews for domestic abuse I've come across, which is hundreds. Then you get the other, let's say, 4.9% who do speak, 
Almost always, they say, yes, I did these things, but she hit me first. You should see what she's like. She's unstable. She's unhinged. Then you have the 0.1% who admit everything and are genuinely sorry for their behaviour. Jordan Worth is none of these. She speaks, admits what she's done, doesn't claim her actions were a response to Alex attacking her, but also shows absolutely no remorse, and she's clearly trying to manipulate the police. I think that Jordan Worth knew when the police got hold of her, she was in trouble. She was out of control, so her natural tendency to manipulate others came out. However, I think in her mind, she didn't really understand what she'd done wrong. She seems to know that isolating someone from their family is wrong, so yeah, I'll deny that. But stabbing someone and burning them with boiling water? What's the problem? Yeah, I'll admit that. And that's the danger of Jordan Worth. I think she admitted that she did these horrible things because her views of serious violence are so normalised that she thinks she's entirely justified in what she's done. So yes, I stabbed and burned someone I claim to love. So what? This would also explain her total lack of remorse and cold demeanour during interview. I'll bring everything together later in the video, but if this doesn't scream psychopathic traits, then I don't know what does. Jordan Worth was released on bail whilst the police built the case against her. TJ and Iris were taken from her care and placed with Alex and his family. Looking at Jordan's Facebook page, she carried on her life as normal, including going on a jolly to Portsmouth in July 2017 and on the 6th of September 2017, she attended her graduation at Hertfordshire University. So when this picture was taken, she was on police bail for almost killing her boyfriend. Finally, on the 28th of September 2017, Jordan Worth was charged with 17 offences, including coercive controlling behaviour within an intimate relationship and multiple counts of wounding, and the more serious charge of assault, causing grievous bodily harm. She was allowed to remain in the community whilst awaiting a court case, but moved to Norfolk, likely as part of her bail conditions. Jordan Worth appeared at Luton Crown Court on the 16th of April 2018 and pleaded guilty to coercive controlling behaviour in an intimate relationship as well as two of the counts of assault causing grievous bodily harm. This had been agreed prior to the court hearing with her pleading guilty as long as most of the charges were not proceeded with. This had nothing to do with remorse. Jordan Worth was unapologetic, but we'll get to that in a moment. Regardless, she'd been convicted. That same day she appeared before Judge Nick Madge. I don't have any sensing remarks, but the Crown Prosecution Service outlined the case in detail over a number of hours, so the true evil of Jordan Worth was laid bare. For the systematic abuse of Alex Skeel, which almost cost him his life, Jordan Worth was sentenced to just seven years in prison a truly appalling sentence for what he'd been through, I think you'll agree. As I mentioned a moment ago, I've no doubt that Jordan Worth's guilty pleas had nothing to do with remorse or actually taking responsibility for what she'd done. She knew if she went to trial and was convinced of everything she'd been charged with, she could potentially be locked up for 15 or more years. She did what best suited her. After her conviction, and whilst Jordan was in prison, there was repeated activity on her Facebook page with links to various articles about men abusing women being posted, as well as one about defamation of character. One link was to an article entitled, quote, How can we protect our daughters from abusive relationships? Now, it's naive to think that people in prison can't get hold of phones and get on the internet, so maybe this was her, or potentially, it was someone close to her, likely a family member, uploading these things. Regardless of whether this was done by Jordan or someone directed by her, it shows how manipulative she really is, with her trying to portray Alex, the man she almost killed, as the aggressor and her as the victim. However, if this was a family member, as I suspect, this gives us an idea of the environment which shaped Jordan, being surrounded by people who would minimise and deny her behaviour. Jordan Worth was released from prison in January 2022 after serving half of her seven-year sentence. It didn't take her long to start lying and manipulating others, and I came across this frankly disgusting fundraising page, which must have been set up soon after her release, where she's trying to get donations to run in the London Marathon. Her blog on the page states, quote, The Centre for Women's Justice and my legal team, who have supported me personally over the last few years, and are continuing to do so. They are experts in their field, and support female offenders 
who have been subject to male violence and historical domestic abuse. They provide legal advice, assistance with public inquiries, inquests and legal challenges. They ensure access to justice for female victims of male violence who find themselves in the criminal justice system due to resisting or retaliating to abuse. My case was complex and complicated, but CWJ gave me the time, effort and energy to understand my case and support me. Please sponsor me to run the London Marathon to help raise money for them. What a sick woman. Essentially she's blaming Alex for what she did to him and worse still, the Centre for Women's Justice is an actual organisation which tries to help real victims of domestic abuse and she was trying to use them to get sympathy and attention. However, Jordan didn't last long in the community and on the 30th of September 2022, just eight months after being released, she was recalled back to prison due to concerns about her behaviour, which included trying to control her boyfriend at the time, which was later reported to be a man called Adam Steff. Doing a bit of digging, it seems that this relationship began in 2021 when Jordan was in prison. Things get weirder after this point. In April 2023, so while she was back in prison, Adam and Jordan apparently became engaged. So based on this, the relationship started and the pair got engaged while she was in prison. This relationship is a massive red flag, which I'll come back to later. In July 2023, Jordan Worth went before the parole board and was granted re-release, with them stating that she'd done some courses and addressed her issues. It appears that, as of November 2023, Adam Steff and Jordan Worth are still together and she's still out in the world. Will his name appear in a future news report as someone harmed by Jordan? I hope to God not, but I don't think there's any real evidence that Jordan Worth is any less dangerous or that she's changed. She came out of prison and began controlling her boyfriend and the only thing stopping her from progressing this was being returned to prison. In around 2025, there will be no oversight of Jordan and I hate to think what will happen when there's no one watching her. She's only 26 years old with plenty of time to ruin other men's lives. I don't think we've heard the last of her. I'll come to support services in a bit, but as a start, I want to return to what I said at the beginning of the video, where I was firm about not disrespecting survivors of domestic abuse or those who have tragically lost their lives at the hands of people who claim they love them. The reason is because it reduces the likelihood that people going through this will seek support, but also it diminishes the bravery of these people and their families who try to turn their horrific experiences into a campaign to help others. This is true of Alex Skeel, who is an absolute legend as far as I'm concerned. He barely escaped the relationship with Jordan Worth with his life, but instead of curling up into a ball and fading away, he waived his right to anonymity and has worked tirelessly to raise awareness about the fact that men can also be victims of domestic abuse too. He's also tried to encourage people to seek help. He's been interviewed numerous times and was the subject of a documentary for the BBC called Abused by My Girlfriend. I'll leave links to that show as well as interviews with Alex in the description box. However, I want to play a small part of one interview as it includes an important message. So it's gone through court. She's, she's now been jailed for yeah. seven and a half years. Have you had any word from her? Have you, have you spoken to her? Has she said why she did this? No. There's been no explanation at all, no. It's all about your future then. What are you looking towards? Um, I hopefully want to start a charity up for abused men to help them get out of the situation or to help them recover if they had got out of the situation. And I just want to help people to speak out, to make it feel comfortable. I've done it and I'm in a far better place. If you don't talk about it, you're never going to get to that far better place. So at least give yourself a chance. Unfortunately, men struggle to talk about their emotions and seek help. A lot of this is because of societal pressures. It's been instilled in many of us that these things don't happen to real men. We're scared of asking for help because we think it makes us look weak. People will mock us or abandon us and we'll be in a worse situation. Domestic abuse is a particular issue which I think is even more difficult for men to acknowledge as it strikes at the heart of how many men see themselves. It's seen as something that only happens to women, which isn't true. 
women are unfortunately more likely to be victims of domestic abuse, with one in four experiencing this during their lives. But for men, it's a much higher rate than you probably realize, at around one in seven. So it's important to highlight, if you are a man experiencing this, it's not as uncommon as you think. You are not alone, and it's not your fault. It definitely doesn't make you any less of a man if it happens to you. I know you're scared, but when you do reach out, you'll be surprised to find that people, on an individual basis, just want to help you. They're like me. They don't care what gender you identify as, whether you're gay, straight, bi, black, white, Asian, pink with yellow spots or whatever. They just see a person who needs help. This is whether you're suffering from general mental health issues or domestic abuse. Let me ask you this. If a man you cared about or loved came to you and asked you for help, would you mock them, shun them? No, you wouldn't. So why would you not be treated in the same way? As to being weak or a coward if you experience these things, do you think Alex Skeel is a coward? Dude is a boss as far as I'm concerned. You are not the one at fault. Your abuser is. They're the weak, pathetic one. No one, and I mean no one, deserves to be harmed by someone who claims to love them. I wanted to get this video out before Christmas for a reason. Unfortunately, there are spikes in the number of instances of domestic abuse around Christmas for obvious reasons. An increase in alcohol use, having to spend more time with an abuser, the stress of wrapping presents, cooking the Christmas dinner. So it's important to reiterate support services, as I've done in my previous videos, which you can turn to over the festive period. As this video is trying to raise awareness about male victims of domestic abuse, I've labelled services for them, but will cover services for women as well. Just to say that all links and contact information will be in the description. So, in the UK, the Great Service for Men is the Men's Advice Line run by Respect. You can contact them in various ways. You can speak to an advisor between 10am and 5pm, Monday to Friday, on 0808, 801 0327. You can also email them on info at mentalviceline or one word, dot org dot uk, with a response being received sometime between Monday to Friday, 9 am to 5 pm. Also, they have a web chat function which is available through the website on a Wednesday between 10 am and 11 30 am, and a Thursday between 2 and 4 pm. This service is for men who are victims of abuse from women as well as same-sex partners. Also, there's the Mankind Initiative, which offers support and advice to male survivors and current victims of domestic abuse. Their phone number is open weekdays, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on 01823 334 244. I haven't forgotten my brothers in Ireland. For you guys, you can get support from Men's Aid Ireland. You can call them on their confidential advice line, which is 01554 3811. This operates Monday to Friday, 9am to 5pm. Also, you can email them on hello at mensaid or one word, dot ie. Again, the emails will be responded to during working hours. In the United States, men can contact the National Domestic Abuse Hotline on 1 800 799 SAFE 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. This is a completely confidential service. I've checked and this service does have trained advisors who can help with men who suffer abuse in relationships. This is also the number that women should call for advice and support. I'm going to spend some time looking into more regional support services in the US, so please bear with me whilst I figure that out. With regards to women in the UK, a good first step is to call the National Domestic Abuse Helpline run by Refuge on 0808 2000 24-7. They'll offer confidential support and advice, and you'll be speaking to a woman. There's also a live chat function where you can speak to an advisor Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. You can also ask them to call you by filling in an online form, and it's clear they handle things professionally. You can include a false name or code word so you don't compromise your safety. Women's Aid is also another amazing organization that offers advice and practical support, and they can be found at www womensaid or one word, .org .uk. The website has lots of information as well as a live chat function which is active between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday and 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. at the weekend. 
there's an option you can click on the website which quickly takes you to a Google Home screen if you need to hide what you're doing from your abuser. In Ireland, please call the National Domestic Abuse Helpline on 1800 341 900. This is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Also, I found a website that gives specific local support services across the whole of Ireland, so I'll leave a link to that as well. However, as I've said in previous videos, if you or someone you know is at imminent risk, then do not hesitate. Call 999 or 911 or whatever the emergency service number is in your area. Just going through all of that hopefully helps both men and women see there is support out there. There are dedicated people all day, every day, who just want to help. They want to help you realise that you are not the problem. They are the abuser. As hard as it may be to believe right now, you're worth so much more than you've been led to believe. Please reach out so others can help you. I knew about this case, but not in detail. I didn't realise until making this video just how dangerous Jordan Worth truly is. There's a lot to unpack here, but I need to provide context by reiterating the most common backgrounds, traits and behaviours of domestic abusers. These individuals have almost always had extremely difficult childhoods, including being neglected or abused, both physically and sexually, witnessing domestic abuse or being abandoned by other parents. This results in them having extremely low self-esteem, as well as a fear of abandonment and difficulties coping in life on their own, as well as managing stressful situations, for example the breakdown of a relationship. These individuals are often dependent on their intimate relationships, but when they go into them, because they feel so low about themselves, they've already convinced themselves that it will come to an end, something they cannot cope with. So they need to utterly control their partner by destroying the person they are and turning them into essentially a shell, someone who will follow the abuser's commands and never leave them. In order to achieve this, various tactics are used, for example, making derogatory comments about them, such as calling them bitch or slag, all in order to make them feel unattractive, unlovable, and convince them that if the relationship ended, no one would ever want them again. Also, isolating them from friends and family. This is in order to make them dependent on the abuser, but also to cut off potential influence that may sever the hold they have, and or remove any avenue for escape. They'll also often isolate and restrict contact with people of the opposite sex, or same sex depending on the type of relationship, because they're scared that if their victim had this type of contact, they'll find someone better and leave them. Then there's emotional manipulation. One of the most common tactics is telling the victim that if the relationship ends, they will kill themselves. Violence is often used to punish any dissent in the relationship. If a rule is violated, then the result is a beating. This not only punishes the victim for what they've apparently done, but shows them the consequences of further non-compliance. It also causes fear in the victim, making them constantly on edge and scared, which erodes their self-esteem feelings of security, and ultimately, who they are as a person. I would say in my experience, 90% of the time, violence is used by perpetrators who themselves witnessed this growing up, and therefore, they were taught that this is the way to behave. A domestic abuser's whole focus is on controlling their partner. This is why comments like, why didn't they just leave, are so ridiculous, like they're telling someone just to walk to the shops. An abuser works extremely hard to close off every avenue of escape. Also, think about it logically. If you've been in a relationship with someone for any period of time, you know details about them, where they live, who their friends are, where they work, what their routine is. If the victim leaves, the abuser is going to use that information to find them. Also, with the most dangerous domestic abusers, they would rather kill their victim than relinquish control over them. And unfortunately, many of them do. Domestic abusers who escalate to this point are the ones with the most entrenched and pervasive issues with self-esteem and abandonment. They're the ones who, despite the fact they have total control over every aspect of their partner's lives, will still have convinced themselves that they'll be abandoned. They're the people who will accuse their partner of cheating on them repeatedly, with no evidence, and their accusations can border on the delusional. As I said in a previous video, I was once involved in a case where a man accused his partner 
of having sex with their dead husband's ashes. I didn't actually say what happened in that case. He eventually tried to kill her by stabbing her, but by some miracle, she survived. These very dangerous people can literally create something out of nothing. If their partner even, on some occasion, looks at someone else, they could be accused of sleeping with them, even if they've never been alone with that person or may not even know them at all. So the victim then ends up in a horrific situation, accused of cheating by someone who's already convinced themselves in their delusional mind that they are guilty. Deny it, they'll be punished for lying. Admit it, they'll be punished for cheating. They can't win. The violence and general abuse used by these most dangerous perpetrators is usually something on another level. Extreme acts of violence, overt threats of murder, all because of their sheer terror that if they don't achieve and maintain complete and utter dominance over their victim, they'll be abandoned. Jordan Worth, in my opinion, fits squarely within this extremely dangerous domestic abuser category. She is a woman with profound underlying issues regarding self-esteem, fear of abandonment, and she's clearly a woman who is completely dependent on intimate relationships and will go to absolutely any lengths to make sure they continue. As I said, this inevitably started in her childhood, which means I find the statement made in court about her growing up in a loving, stable family home ridiculous. Potentially, we'll never know what she was exposed to as a child, but her issues are so extreme that I suspect that she was the victim of chronic neglect and, given the savagery of the violence she used, exposed to this in the home. It's important to point out that some of the abuse of Alex by Jordan occurred in her home, so her family must have heard what was going on, and, as I said, I'd be surprised if her Facebook page was not being used by a blood relation to spread her lies. So this would suggest she grew up in an environment where her manipulative and abusive behaviour was normalised and likely justified. I don't believe for a second that Jordan Worth did not show any signs of problematic behaviour before abusing Alex. She's clearly a very skilled manipulator, so she likely honed her craft, potentially in other relationships or generally in her childhood, using others to get what she wanted. So, she met Alex Skeel, someone she could latch onto, and from day one, began chipping away at who he was and moulding him into a person who would never leave her. She began with criticising his appearance and clothing, subtle ways of getting him to do what she wanted, but also making him question himself. She ran off randomly one day, to cause him to be scared about her. She messed with his head, switching from Jekyll to Hyde, all as a way to keep Alex continuously on the back foot and eventually questioning his perception of reality. Jordan cut off every avenue of escape, taking away Alex's means to communicate with those who loved him and who could have helped him, but being skilled enough to know that she needed to reach out every now and then, and this was to tell them, in the guise of Alex, that he didn't want anything to do with them anymore. As I said earlier, we cannot tell if Jordan got pregnant deliberately, but I have no doubt that she saw her children as a way to permanently link Alex to her. She didn't care about them. I have no doubt that she would have hurt the children if she thought it would have benefited her and enabled her to control Alex. But also, look at what she exposed them to. Her stabbing, beating and burning their father right in front of them. Her level of sexual jealousy is off the chart. She saw any woman as a threat. If Alex was allowed to have even the briefest contact with any female, then he would leave her. She couldn't have that so she made it impossible for him to communicate with anyone else but her. Even then, she repeatedly accused him of cheating on her, and, from what I've read, even him thinking about another girl was unacceptable to her. The unhinged nature of Jordan Worth is perfectly encapsulated by the fact she bought essentially a joke toy online and used this as a way to interrogate Alex about him cheating on her. Within the flat, with no one watching, Jordan was free to continue to completely destroy the man that Alex was. She starved him, making him too weak to leave, and beat, burned and stabbed him day in and day out. I imagine Alex breathing the wrong way led to violence. He would only stay if he was utterly destroyed in every possible way. Alex is 100% correct. She would have killed him. He was her possession, and if he tried to leave on his own, she would have seen this as the ultimate betrayal. How dare you leave me? How dare you leave me to cope on my own? I can't bear the thought of you going off with someone else. If I can't have you, 
no one else can. These traits are bad enough, but there are two elements of Jordan Worth's personality which I think elevates her level of dangerousness even higher. The first of these are clear psychopathic traits, which I think is demonstrated by Jordan's demeanour during her police interview, where she shows no evidence of remorse, regret, or empathy for anything she's done. This indicates that she's willing to use horrific acts of violence without batting an eyelid. The other trait is sadism. I noticed something that Alex said in one of the passages I quoted about Jordan escalating from hitting him with a bottle to a hammer to using a knife as his tolerance to pain increased. I think this was entirely deliberate of that Jordan Worth wanted to see Alex in pain. I think she got some sort of thrill out of it. This again stems from the deep dark hole inside of her. She felt powerful and it bolstered her self esteem knowing that she was the one who caused these things. Eventually, she poured boiling water over him and then she could look at Alex's burnt flesh and broken teeth and think, I did that. So you have potentially a psychopathic sadist who is incapable of coping on her own, who appears to have no remorse or guilt for her actions, who seeks out relationships to rely upon and quickly begins to control her partners to the point where she'll completely isolate them, starve them and brutally assault them, all so she doesn't have to confront her feelings of loneliness and fear of abandonment. Is Jordan Worth still a risk? Absolutely. And alarm bells are ringing right now. As I said earlier, domestic abusers move from relationship to relationship. This is clear evidence that they're just continuing the pattern of behaviour. With Jordan, this is even more extreme. While she was sat in prison for almost killing one boyfriend, she apparently started another relationship. Not only that, when she came out, she began to control him and so was sent back to prison. In amongst all of that, she lied and manipulated others, trying to blame Alex for her own actions. Like I said, I pray that her new partner is not harmed, but I think Jordan Worth is just as dangerous as she was when she abused Alex, and I can imagine her sat in a police interview room, being questioned on suspicion of murder, telling the police exactly what she did in a childlike voice, not showing any sign of emotion or sign that she's done anything wrong. As usual, I'd love your thoughts on this case. If you like the content, then consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button. You can also send a donation by using the thanks button. Please like, share and subscribe. This is the last video before the festivities, so I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.